So dear friends, welcome to this special evening on artificial intelligence hosted by the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at Hellenic College Holy Cross. We're grateful to you for your presence. We're grateful to the audience uh, that's following the live stream. And we're especially honored to have with us the benefactor of our institute, the Honorable Michael Huffington. A recent article in Time magazine remarked about AI that there's a marketplace for this stuff. The genie's out of the bottle. And in some ways, that's true, though we are in the initial stages. In other ways, it's all moving much faster than we can ever imagine. What can AI do? What can AI not do? What should AI not do? Can AI do everything? Does it substitute God, the hand of God? Because scripture says that it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We know it can prove useful for enhancing security on social media platforms, for protecting consumers from scammers or bots, but if AI can, as we're told, advance, for instance, the hospitality and restaurant businesses by predicting markets and trends, can it replace our connection with a welcoming host or a gracious server or a master sommelier? Can it replace a special night out with food and drink with all its interactions and experiences? what the church calls communion and thanksgiving. There's no doubt that AI can prove a game changer, certainly in the field of medicine, in the field of disability that I'm interested in. It can be a plain leveler, balancing economic and social inequities for the public interest. Some liken AI to nuclear technology, precious but perilous. It's already used in military operations. In fact, Ukraine has become a living laboratory for testing AI in real life conditions, collecting data, clearing minds, rooting out corruption, even settling displaced refugees. So it can be good if it's not controlled by a few individuals or a few companies. Some tech giants and corporations are already lobbying to block relevant legislation. And the problem is not just the regulating of the AI landscape, but also the channeling of public resources, because AI is an expensive business. And then there's the impact on democracy. Initially, we all loved AI. We saw it as a compelling platform for liberty, for democracy. We thought it could help spread liberty and democracy. Think of the Arab Spring, think of the Me Too movement, even the Black Lives Matter movement. But now, now we're witnessing a global erosion of democracy. Now we're learning that the devastating consequences of AI can cause damage in the hands of bad actors and authoritarian leaders. Now, big social media companies can determine what we see on their platforms, including extreme political and polarizing views. Now, we learn that with the capacity to shape new content in a frightening way, AI can also create false national and international narratives with lightning speed. And last month's economist cautioned, in the battle between the fakers and the detectives, it seems that the fakers have the upper hand. So when we step into the business of creating intelligent machines, are we approaching, or are we even maybe appropriating, the realm of the divine? 
And if AI is competing against or comparing with God, does ethics have a role to play? What does theology have to learn here? And how should ethics interact with AI? My hope in organizing this panel without truly remarkable and gifted speakers, whom I sincerely thank in advance, is to open the door to such questions, to break open some new horizons, to advance conversation between disciplines. If there's one thing that our Huffington Ecumenical Institute should stand for, it's that we should not fear or shy away from courageous and constructive dialogue. So we will begin this evening with Dr. Daskalakis. You have the names and the brief biographical notes of all the speakers in your folders. Dr. Daskalakis will lay the necessary foundations, necessary principles for a discussion about AI. And then we'll move on to our other distinguished speakers who will explore the more philosophical, the social, the ethical, even the pastoral dimensions of our discussion. And we will, I promise, also allow a good time for questions. Dr. Daskalakis. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father Chrysavgis. Uh, uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, thanks to Chrysula, Markella, and uh, uh, Elena for uh, inviting me uh, and organizing this event uh, together with other uh, Chrysavis. Uh, so th uh, the goal of my talk is to um, sort of like uh, uh, present the, some of the uh, technical foundations of AI. I'm, I'm not going to go super deep, uh, but uh, it's important before we start talking about uh, 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 the ethics around the, the use of AI to actually understand the capabilities of the technology as well as the limitations of the technology because that paints a, uh, 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 you know, that's a good framework for thinking about uh, the other uh, questions. So, um, uh, as you all know, as you see on social media or articles and, and so on and so forth, AI has done uh, major breakthroughs in the past uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, and those breakthroughs pertain to different data uh, modalities that uh, computers are now able to understand. So in the different panels of this uh, slide, uh, you know, you, you see different data modalities that now computers can understand. So images, speech, molecules, uh, and, and, and difficult games, uh, uh, recreational or other games, strategic interactions. So I want to do a, a, a deeper dive into exactly uh, what these capabilities are and what the limitations are of AI. And, and before I start, let's uh, try to define AI, although it's a, it's a difficult thing to define. So what is AI? Uh, so one definition by uh, Astro Teller is uh, AI is the science of uh, how to get machines to do what they do in the movies, <laughs> right? So. And you know, like, I mean, if you look at movies from the 70s, uh, per, you know, perhaps some of the things that movies uh, were doing in the 70s, current technology can actually deliver. But, but of course, you know, it, you know, the post is always moving to, towards things that uh, 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 technology cannot deliver right now. OK, so that's kind of like an elusive definition of AI. Uh, and more practical from my late colleague, uh, pa Patrick Winston, uh, is AI is the study of the computations that make it possible to perceive, reason about, and, and make and, and make and, and choose good actions for, for achieving certain goals. For example, uh, you know, playing games, uh, uh, processing natural language, uh, reasoning uh, about you know the world around you and the impact of your actions, and so on and so forth. All right. But this is a very difficult task. Uh, and let me try to explain, sort of like to lay the foundations of where we're starting from and what we want to achieve. It's a very difficult task, because when a human looks at an image, like the, this image here from some Greek uh, town, like beach town, uh, you know, you, the, the human brain can easily do a lot of things with an image, OK? So it can understand you know, the context, the objects it contains, 
perhaps it can extrapolate what may be happening outside of the of this uh, photo and so on and so forth. So, so humans can do it like, you know, you see some abandoned, you know, like coffee here, you, you know, you know that some person was having coffee there before. The human brain can do a lot of stuff uh, automatically when looking at an image. But uh, for a computer, inherently, an image looks like this. Bef before we tell the computer, you know, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning, like the way the computer stores an image in its uh, uh, hard drive or its memory, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mess uh, of, of raw pixels. So, so AI is the uh, study of what computations allow a computer that inherently thinks about pixels, pixel information, to extract from an image or, or, or some other data modality, uh, for that matter, semantic, interesting semantic information that is stored in all those pixels. So this is where we're starting from, right? So this is the what the computer inherently understands. And AI is the study of what algorithms can um, teach the computer to extract from this room, this mess, uh, you know, the, the stuff that humans understand when looking at an image. And, and, you know, similarly for other data modalities, what is contained in natural language, what, 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 you know, what we know, uh, you know, stuff about molecules and, you know, how to play difficult games and things like that. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you get from this point to that point? Uh, there's an obvious approach for how to do that, which is, well, you know, existentially, such a thing is possible because the human brain is a computer that does this. So there exists a computer, okay, it's not a in silico, it's a, uh, you know, a biological computer, but such a computer exists. So these algorithms do exist uh, in the wild, uh, you know, created by evolution or God or wherever you think, you know, the human brain came from. So, you know, the obvious approach to achieve this is to just copy the human brain, okay? So, you know, you have this computer here, you just study, you know, all the connections and how the neurons fire and this and that, and you just replicate that whole operation outside of, of biology in silico. Uh, so this is the obvious approach, but, it, you know, it has failed us so far, okay? So we understand very little about how... I mean, we, we're increasingly improving our understanding, but we've, you know, way behind actually being able to copy, uh, 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 you know, the operations in, inside a human brain in silico. Okay, so that's one approach. It, it's not going to work anytime soon. The other approach is to do essentially what we did uh, with airplanes, right? So, like, you know, we had uh, a bird that could fly. Uh, we didn't copy the bird. It's not like we copied the bird. We created an alternative, uh, you know, technology that can also fly. It's different than the bird. It's our own construct, okay? So, we, you know, we thought independently. I mean, we use, of course, some principles that we figured out from by observing, you know, birds fly and, you know, like our understanding of physics and this and that. But we created an alternative to uh, a way to fly, which is the airplane. Uh, similarly, we can try to create an alternative to the human brain, meaning we can devise our own algorithms to look at the pixels and extract, you know, you know, figure out, you know, how from the pixels extracts, you know, objects, meaning, and this and that. Uh, and I guess, you know, like when I say algorithms, I need to explain myself a little more. Algorithms are uh, basically recipes uh, to excruciating details, so recipes of the form, you know, look at pixel, you know, 32 uh, at the location, uh, you know, 32, you know, 45, you know, add that, you know, whatever pixel value you see there to this, you know, pixel value in the other location, and this and that compute some complicated function that is excru in excruciating detail explained to the computer. This is what an algorithm is. A an algorithm is uh, a, a, a recipe uh, for how to carry out a computation described very, very precisely, because uh, ultimately computers only understand how to get things from their memory, add them up, multiply them or whatever, store them back to memory and this and that. So, um, um, uh, you know, and uh, uh, when we want to extract, you know, create our own algorithms to do this, you know, to solve this perception task, we have to divide, you know, we have to come up with 
uh, our own, you know, you know, function that maps, uh, you know, an image to the contents, a speech to, you know, the contents, and this and that. So that is the classical approach to AI since the 50s or 60s, <coughs> and it hasn't worked. Okay, it's worked to a very uh, non-impressive uh, uh, degree. It didn't work. So the approach that did work is a little bit of an uh, interesting approach that I want to talk about in the next slide, which is sort of like what you know, you know, computer scientists like to do, which is uh, what is called recursion. So what is, what is recursion? So you know, so it's, it, we are unable to create algorithms that solve the AI problem. So let's instead create an algorithm that will find the algorithm to solve the problem. Okay, so rather than us defining the algorithm that solves the problem, we define this meta algorithm that whose goal is to <coughs> figure out what is the right algorithm to solve the problem. Okay, it's, it's, this is the approach. So how do you do that? How do you how do you design a, an algorithm that will itself take the role of finding the algorithm that solves the problem? Well, what you do is this. So you start with a, a very complicated uh, architecture and very flexible architecture that can express very complicated reasoning processes. And um, what you do, you, you know, this, this has a lot of flexibility. So now you basically ask your, you know, this meta algorithm to set uh, the parameters of that architecture so that the problem that you want to solve is solved, meaning uh, uh, it does well on some training data that you, uh, ha you know, have provided it, right? So what you do is you create this interesting architecture that is very flexible. <coughs> you collect a lot of data from the real world. And you have the meta algorithm set the parameters of this flexible architecture so that it does well in the examples that you gave it. Like in the same way that, you know, like when a child is born, you know, like the brain, you know, has a lot of capacity, but, you know, all the connections have not been, you know, linked and, you know, like and so on and so forth. And, you know, you, you teach your kid, you know, you, you collect some training data for your kid and, you know, uh, you know, hopefully that helps it build the right connections. It's kind of like the same approach. Okay. So now where do you find the examples? Where you find examples is that, you know, like humanity over the past, uh, since the internet, or, you know, even before that a little bit, has, you know, created a lot of digital data, okay? So it has a big digital footprint. So you use, you exploit that digital footprint to uh, get, to create from it training examples for this process. Well, that's the approach, mm -hmm. right? uh, And it has been a very successful approach. Uh, it's an approach that delivered all the progress that we have seen in the past uh, 15 years. Which is why people say that data is the new oil. Because, you know, like to, to make this approach work, you cannot uh, think in vacuum and create your own algorithms. You have to actually get training <coughs> material for your algorithms, right? So uh, uh, all this technology is founded on having enough data. So it's very data hungry. And uh, as I was saying, this approach has delivered all the progress we have seen this, to this day. Let me um, just to kind of like illustrate the amazing uh, state of uh, uh, affairs. Let me just pick a couple of these data modalities and show you what technology has, uh, has been able to do. So I'm going to be talking about natural language and, and images, but you know, there's, there's amazing progress for other uh, interesting tasks. Uh, so natural language uh, uh, has seen a breakthrough over the past few years, uh, uh, more recently. Uh, you, know, mo mo you know, most of you perhaps first heard it uh, in the context of GPT. There, there is some progress that, you know, uh, GPT, uh, 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 before GPT. Uh, uh, and it has to do with what are called language models. So, so language models are basically a sophisticated version of uh, what your uh, cell phone can do, right? So when you are texting to somebody, your phone suggests you possible answers automatically, right? Uh, these answers, the way they're, you know, the, the way their computer is, they're, they're trained on your previous conversations, and, you know, you have like a, perhaps some rule-based system that also uh, gives possible answers, but 
language models are models that are built on the whole of the internet. Okay, so all you know, all the books you can find in digital form, all of the the crawl of the, the whole internet, all of Wikipedia. Uh, so you you train a model that, given some text, recommends how to fill in the next. Uh, what is the, what is a you know a good next word, and you know like if you have that, that's all you need because you know. After you guess the next word, you can guess the word after the next, and then you know the, the word after next, and so on and so forth. So you can write the whole thing after the initial prompt that somebody gave you. So this is what language models do, but um, which is the same that are used in your cell phone, but on, on steroids, trained on a ton of data, on all the data you can find. When you train uh, a model on all the data, this kind of model that predicts the next word given a prefix, uh, as it turns out, it becomes pretty amazing. Okay, so and let me show you some examples of how amazing it is. Uh, so one example is okay, like I'm gonna do one example from my own research. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, you know, I got you know, I went to ChatGPT and I said, "Can you write a rap song about uh, Daskalakis, Goldberg, Papadimitriou theorem?" Uh, to, to give you some context, this theorem is about the intractability, so some intractability result in game theory, intractability of arriving at equilibrium in complex strategic situations. So here's the rap song that uh, uh, GPT generated in like, you know, a few seconds. I'm here to spit some truth about a theorem that's real. It's called the DGP and it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and games a strategy, we want, you know, so it, not only is it able to write, uh, <laughs> so, so not only, so the point is, not only is it able to write a rap song, but also it knows about this. I mean, how, do, how the heck does it know about this? Well, at some point on the internet, as it was reading all of the internet, it saw references to, uh, you know, my paper with those co-authors, and it understood it's about game theory, it understood the content of it, and managed to write this rap song. That's really impressive. Uh, for my next example, uh, it's not mine, it's, uh, you know, found it on the internet. Can you write, can you rewrite uh, each line of Genesis using only words starting with the letter A? <laughs> so here's the output. Uh, so it's a bit, it's like 31 uh, <coughs> lines, but at arrival, almighty assembled ab above an abyss. Abyss, absent actuality, abandoned, all around abysmal. Almighty's aura above aqua and, and et cetera, et cetera, wow. the whole thing. <laughs> I think there are some words that are, did not start with A, but this is pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the one, here's a word without an, that does not start. I, I think it didn't know how to say fifth with starting with an A, right? So it said quinte. It didn't know how to say day, so it said age. And it didn't know how to say five. Starting with A, so it's like quintets. But okay, so it's pretty impressive, nevertheless. Right, so that's how impressive technology is in understanding natural language, using natural language, and generating natural language. It's pretty impressive. The, and, and this is all the rage about you know AI, like uh, as of you know a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, we're also able to understand images, generate images, and also combine language and images. And let me show you this example from DALI. So DALI is a model that is, you, you know, it's a generative model that is trained to uh, sample a joint, so to, to sample an image and a caption for the image. It's, it's, it's trained basically on uh, all captioned images you can find on the internet. So you find all possible captioned images you can find on the internet, and you train a model that can generate jointly an image and a caption. After you train this model, you can now use it to, to sample conditionally. Give a caption and get an image, give an image, get a caption, and so on and so forth. So here are some examples. Uh, painting of a family of tiny hippos inside of an old-fashioned vintage suitcase. That's the prompt. <laughs> this is the output. This is pretty cool, right? I mean, for creatives, for people in creative industries, this is amazing to be able to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not an artist. I'm not going to tell you how amazing this is. But <laughs> for like, you know, if I didn't have money to hire a creative in my company, I would just write this and get something, OK? Uh, here's another example. A steal of Kermit the Frog in a Wes Anderson film. It's <laughs> pretty good, no? <laughs> I mean, where the heck did it understand that this is the style of, uh, I mean, this is the style of Wes Anderson, at least to my eyes. Uh, 
you know, this, of course, these images don't exist anywhere, right? It, they are, these are creations of this technology. They're pretty amazing. And, you know, I mean, I have some other examples here, like an astronaut riding a horse in photorealistic style, uh, in a style of Andy Warhol, in a pencil drawing. Uh, and, you know, I mean, again, just to uh, emphasize the point, it has to learn the style of Andy Warhol. It was never taught what the style of Andy Warhol is. In fact, I don't know how to mathematically describe what makes a painting Andy Warhol or pencil drawing or photo. I, it's hard for me to describe it mathematically, what makes each of these styles, right? So uh, it's hard for me to describe it. It is a byproduct of training on a ton of data that it, it figures it out. No, like no human actually helped it. Uh, it just saw a lot of images from Andy Warhol. Uh, it saw a lot of Philip Ponsil drawings, and you know, and you know, associating captions and images. It actually, as a byproduct, understands uh, sort of like a lot about uh, painting and and drawing, and you know, like like you know, like uh, images. So so that's the point, right? So remember where we started. We started from the, our starting point was that for inherently for computers. Everything is boring, pixel. It's just boring. Everything is boring. There are zero ones that are stored in the hard drive. From that starting point, we have arrived at this. This is pretty impressive. This is the AI revolution, right? This is the fact that we have conquered all these data modalities I was talking about before. And I'll show you two examples. What I want to do, though, next is to also offer you an objective uh, view of, of reality, because this all sounds impressive, but there are some limitations. I want to talk about uh, the limitations before actually passing on, on to the more uh, philosophical and ethical dimensions of, of the problem. So what are the limitations? The limitations, you know, I have a series, uh, uh, you know, several of those limitations. Let me go through them. First one is that Technology, as impressive as it is, it's also not super reliable. Okay, perhaps it solved 80% of the problem, but it doesn't hasn't solved 99.99% of the problem. Which you would need, for example, an application like self-driving cars. This is a self-driving car that crashes onto some vehicle parked on the left hand side of, the, of a highway. Uh, and here, uh, you know, like one comment I would like to make because it's important is that there are several narratives about AI. The number, narrative you hear from CEOs of companies, and the narratives you hear, the narrative you hear about more objective people who, you know, uh, uh, you know, are not going to make money, uh, you know, in the next couple of years out of it. So, so uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, Tesla in, in in the Investor Day, uh, you know, uh, you know, they said, uh, uh, so if, you know, the FSD mode of Tesla, the full self driving mode of Tesla has a crash rate that is one-fifth of that of humans. Elon Musk says, I think at the same event, at the point of which you believe, I guess this is, I guess, more diplomatically stated, that adding autonomy reduces injury and death, I think you have a moral obligation, mm -hmm. a moral obligation uh, to deploy this technology, okay? Uh, of course, uh, that's a company talking, okay? And if you do investigative analysis of, you know, like what data they released and, you know, what data is actually recorded uh, in, you know, like uh, various author transportation authorities around the country, uh, and you process that data, you see that actually FSD has 10 times more, uh, is 10 times more dangerous than uh, humans. So, so it's important to, uh, uh, you know, have a, a, an objective viewpoint and that, you know, like can inform how we regulate this space, right? So we don't want, uh, you know, Boeing testing their own technology because, you know, like the transportation authority cannot test it, okay? So uh, you, you, need, you, need, you need to be, uh, you, you know, we need some, you know, understanding of what's going on. So that's example number one about reliability. Here's another example uh, uh, involving ChatGPT this time. So I, I go and ask GPT to help me play tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe is trivial, right? I mean, you know, like everybody can play tic-tac-toe. It's not uh, that hard. And, you know, it has seen a lot of tic-tac-toe be being played on the internet. It's not like it's not a, it knows the game. I mean, I tell you, I'm the ex-player in a game of tic-tac-toe. The other player, I hope you can see from the back. If you don't, that doesn't matter too much. But like, 
I'm the X player in a game of tic-tac-toe. The other player is, oh, I, I'm supposed to play next. What should I do? Uh, and you know, if you look at the board configuration here, there is a forced win for me. I can just play X here and win the game. Uh, uh, for the life of me, I cannot you know, get it to help me to be accurate in tic-tac-toe, but regardless of how I prompt it. So it asks me to play here, you know, which is not uh, you know, optimal. Like I, I will draw or lose the game if I, if I follow the advice. You know, I've tried a lot of prompting. It doesn't, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard for it to plan. Mm. It can generate next tokens and, you know, start, you know, giving me, you know, do the genesis, <laughs> uh, write the genesis with the letter starting from A, but it cannot plan. It's not, uh, these are not good at planning and even worse are strategic planning mm. when, when uh, uh, the interaction involve other agents. So here, okay, so here's another example. Jack's dad has, has, has three sons, Jack, Peter, and dot, 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 question mark. And then he gets into some kind of like <laughs> breakdown. The third son's name is Jack's dad has three sons, therefore the answer is Jack. Uh, for the life of me, I don't know what's going on. But uh, th there are points of failure and they involve, you know, like more interesting uh, uh, reasoning tasks. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing I want to mention is that AI systems can be biased, and that's an important consideration. And that goes back to what I we were talking about earlier, which is that these systems are trained on data. If the data you train on are biased because you know, society is biased, your uh, uh, systems are also gonna be biased. Like in the same way that if a little kid that we're talking about earlier grows up in a, in a, in a house of racists, it's gonna become racist. In the same way, technology that only sees, say, white people's images may not be able to reconstruct, obviously, Obama's pixelated image uh, into uh, Obama, but uh, a white person, okay? So, and when you take that technology and use it in the judicial system, or other uh, applications that uh, uh, where you know society uh, you know has been uh, uh, biased, uh, it's really problematic, right? And and you know this article by uh, ProPublica from you know several years ago now raised uh, uh, the the alarm for for this compass system that is used in law enforcement in the United States uh, that is being used to rank. Uh, the risk factor presented by somebody who has been arrested for a crime, uh, determining whether th they should be uh, uh, put in jail before the trial or not. Okay, so, uh, uh, and you know, you can see like obvious biases that the system has. Like, for example, in this case, uh, as a white person that has a lot of prior offenses, uh, scored as lower risk than a, a black uh, teenager who has very few offenses. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the system is biased, and if it, it's m more biased, if you think about the fact that probably if you're white and you do a petty theft, I haven't tried it, but <laughs> conjecturing here, uh, you know, there is some decent chance that's not going to go on your record, okay? But, you know, so, so, you know, it's already biased, let alone if you consider other biases that enter the picture before we even arrive at the point of recording the data. So, so it's problematic, I believe uh, it's gonna be uh, discussed uh, later on. Uh, third point of failure is ma uh, that systems can be manipulated. Uh, this picture is recognized by the best image recognition algorithm as an airliner. This picture here is recognized by, as a pig by the same system. Now the difference between this image and that image, which is to us imperceptible, is that somebody went and added a tiny, 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 tiny bit of this noise to that image. So if you add this, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of this image to that image, pixel-wise, you'll get this image. Because you added, added so little of this image, nothing really is perceptible to humans. But if you orchestrate uh, what noise you add, you can actually completely throw off the, the, the best uh, image recognition algorithms. Uh, and that can be deeply problematic, as you can imagine. Um, uh, 
th this is a turtle that uh, some MIT students uh, 3D printed. Now what they did is they went and, and colored the shell of that uh, turtle uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that this shell is recognized as a rifle by the top image recognition algorithm, which is fine, I guess, in this case, but like the opposite would be bad, right? Like I arrive at the airport with a rifle and I, you know, it looks like I have a backpack uh, that is a, you know, a turtle shape, okay? <laughs> Uh, so that, you know, manipulation is an important problem. If you deploy the systems wildly uh, and they're prone to manipulation, that's a problem, as you may imagine. <laughs> um, here's another way uh, 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 they're manipulated. In, in this case, not because you orchestrated, you know, noise, you know, throughout your image in a complicated way, but because there are other agents involved. So th this is a Waymo car trying to make a, enter into a highway in California. It has its blinker on, it's trying to enter, but it's antagonized so much by human drivers mm -hmm. but it, that it cannot change lanes, it abandons the attempt and tries again. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, I, I also have such experience in California <laughs> where you know, like, uh, you know, there's like a huge line of traffic for no reason and at the top of the line is a Waymo car that wants to do something, it's being, very, very pessimistic, very, very conservative about the uh, situation. Effectively, it's not using strategy yeah. in the way that we use when we drive on the road, and it's unable to actually perform okay, <coughs> in this strategic interaction. Uh, so training these agents that are gonna interact with humans and or other self-driving cars has to take into account in the training the strategic, antagonistic, or cooperative situations that the agents are going to find themselves in. Uh, you know, like with, 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 with uh, uh, a couple of students uh, a few years ago, uh, we, we wrote an article about why uh, somehow like these failure modes are, are, are inherent in the current way, in the, in, the, in, the, in the way we train agents these days. Um, I had another slide for agents who collude, but I'm gonna skip it. So they're, they, you know, agents can collude with each other if you let them in the wild. I'm not gonna talk about it. This is a case of uh, sellers using AIs to price their goods on Amazon and, and you know, uh, collude, like, and, and you know, uh, if you let them loose, they may actually, uh, you know, without explicitly colluding, they may actually uh, compute very not collusive prices, like they may, lead to very high prices that, of course, you want to avoid in an automated, uh, you know, platform where, you know, you want your sellers to be able to adapt their prices to the competition, but you want to avoid collusive uh, effects. Uh, I want to sort of wrap it up, uh, and before I pass it on, I want to just give you one slide with why technology is so impressive, but why it also fails, okay? And I want to go back to the, you know, in the, to the very beginning of my talk today, which was about the winner approach to AI, which as you remember, it was basically, you start with a very complicated, tunable architecture, and you progressively improve the connectivity in that architecture, like, like in the same way that the baby improves the connectivity in its brain or you know, changes the connectivity in its brain on expensive hardware. So this is a very also compute hungry technology. So it does well on examples that you have obtained from the real world. So this was the winning approach to AI. And everything that I've highlighted here is a cause of concern mm -hmm. is, is my point for this slide. I'm not gonna dive too much deep into this, but let me just point out a few problems with this approach. If a model that you're using, a neural net, uh, uh, if a model that you're using has too many parameters, then after training, it's gonna be very non-interpretable, what exactly it does. It's gonna be effectively a black box. It's gonna tell you, give you a decision, okay, this person should get a loan and this person shouldn't get a loan. And you wouldn't be able to understand why it's making that call. Um, If it's so complicated, you know, you're training it on data you collected from the world, but you know, complicated things are very hard to train. So it may not actually, the training may not converge. 
Expensive hardware, you, you know, we don't, don't all have access to expensive hardware. OpenAI does, Google does, but how about the rest of us? Are we going to be able to compete in that space if we don't have access to hardware? Uh, what does it mean to do well? These models are trained for one task, say predict the next word after a prefix of words, but then are used to rewrite the genesis, uh, advises how to play tic-tac-toe, and so on and so forth. So the objective they were trained on, which is to next token predict, next word prediction, has nothing to do with the downstream tasks that we might intend to use them for. And this misalignment of objectives is a problem because uh, you know, it's different to do well at token prediction. Okay, that's just <coughs> imitating the text corpora you trained on. That's very different from being able to solve math problems, uh, play games, or whatever. This is two tasks that are very different, but we're misusing a model use, uh, trained for some task in some other tasks. That could be a, a, a root of issues. Um, let me do, not dive into this. And you know, like this objective could be misaligned also with our you know moral codes, or you know, like like the, the you know the proxy objective could be completely misaligned with you know uh, you know what we think is ethical or proper uh, downstream. I've already talked about uh, training examples from the world. These are biased. Society is biased, so the data generated is biased. So if that is my training data, my model is going to be biased. And lastly, data from the real world, you know, uh, maybe it's private, maybe uh, it's copyright material. Uh, you know, it's not clear uh, what is the right contract, what is the, what is the, what is the economic contract uh, via which uh, OpenAI should use my data to train their model. So it's, uh, it's a, that's also an ethical problem. So let me leave it uh, here and conclude. Uh, with the last slide saying, okay, what to do, okay, in, the, in, this, in this context. So the first thing to do is to breathe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, literally, at this point, humanity is much more threatened by climate change than AI. We're not at the singularity <coughs> events. Uh, we haven't deployed the technology autonomously too widely. There is still room to maneuver, okay? <laughs> Uh, and, and you know the, what I said earlier. You have to follow an objective narrative of you know where where, where we stand, uh, and and you know put less talk on, on companies and CEOs. Okay. Uh, uh, important AI regulation processes are uh, 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 you know uh, unraveling right now. Uh, so EU, uh, EU is you know passing an AI act. Uh, you know the US government. Uh, Created uh, AI bills of right and, and you know is passing more uh, the, uh, regulation and several countries are positioning themselves in this space. Uh, some key considerations to consider down the road. Here are some like three important sort of like considerations: what data can be used for training AI models and how? What problems should AI be used for? And how to improve its safety and transparency. Uh, here are some thoughts of mine. Uh, uh, for, for, for what data can be used, you have to protect the privacy and the copyright. Uh, you have to protect data providers, as uh, you know, every one of us, from being uh, uh, disadvantageously treated by AI that is built on our own data. Uh, or at least compensated you know, for that possibility. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, take measures to avoid incorporating the biases in the data into your models. Uh, yeah, and even like, you know, like one point that I think is uh, uh, often uh, not, uh, people don't pay attention to, but e even when you define your variables in, in a, in a, in a, for a statistical analysis, even if you define race or gender or this and that, you're already introducing bias in your, no, let alone, you know, like, how you collect your data, but even just the variable names in, in themselves uh, have bias, and you have to at least be aware that you are making uh, a choice 
when you decide what variables to include in your model. Uh, on the applications, uh, uh, you, know, sh you know, should we use AI in the justice system, patient care, uh, determine access to education and loan? Should we do that? Um, uh, and if so, how to do this in the proper way? Uh, how, how can we control misinformation? Uh, as Father Ekrisavgis mentioned earlier, that's a huge problem and it will become even worse. Uh, how much to restrict the fakes? That's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, related uh, uh, questions. And when do you allow full autonomy? Should, should, you know, should you let it go on its own or should you uh, create collaborative frameworks for AI and humans to uh, cooperate? Uh, and lastly, to improve uh, safety and transparency, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, th this is part of, for example, in the EU Act, there are measures taken uh, for this. You know, you have to be transparent about what data you use to, to, to train your model on, what your architecture is, what the objective function was, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, op open sourcing your models is very important in a space where the models are already very complicated. So if you don't reveal what the model is, what data it was trained on, and you know, people only can query the model and get an answer. Uh, uh, it, it's going to be very hard to understand the limitations uh, uh, and you know, like uh, and, and you know, prop, proper uses of, of that technology. Uh, with those thoughts, uh, I want to I want to thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the next. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Vaskalakis, thank you so so much for introducing the subject to yeah, us in course. such a comprehensible and accessible way. I don't know that I'm interested in a white Obama, <laughs> but a black Trump could be very interesting, <laughs> especially <laughs> since he has a, seems to have some sort of a, an identity with the, the black people these days. Uh, thank you for laying the groundwork here for the rest of our discussion. Dr. Psimopoulos. So while, while Costi is uh, just uh, pulling up, oh, okay, great, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Costi. Um, can you still hear me okay? Oh, it's coming up, eh? Okay, great. So I hope you can all see that, even those letters down, down below. Uh, first of all, it's such a wonderful pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, Father John, thank you so much for, for inviting me. And, uh, and of course, you know, Chrisula and Markella and Elena and, and everybody else uh, who, who are here from Hellenic College Holy Cross and the ecumenical, uh, Huffington Ecumenical Institute. And of course, it is a huge surprise to me at least that we have Mr. Huffington himself. So thank you so much for making this happen in, in a big way as well for the Institute at large. <coughs> uh, now, before I go, go into my presentation, you probably have noticed that we share at least one thing with Costi, which is the name, right? At least one thing. Now, for those who are in the room, you can all absolutely tell uh, for which one of the two Costises people actually showed up. But for those on live stream, you cannot tell, but I can tell you that there is no doubt the parking lot was full, so this doesn't usually happen for this costi. It, it is definitely for that costi. So this is a, a caveat or a premise here. All right. So, uh, and of course, I learned so much from this presentation as I usually do from listening to Costin on other occasions. Now, uh, you can see behind me that uh, the image is the same AI-generated image that was used in the, in the promotional material. And I thought, uh, I was thinking maybe, Father John, you would mention that, but this gives me the opportunity to say myself that I experimented while Costi was telling us about DALI. I said, okay, let me play around with that and actually did this. No, I'm just kidding. I did that before, but uh, this is from DALI as well. And I wouldn't have known about DALI if it weren't for another amazing I MIT professor who is in the room, Manolis Kellis. And many, some of you know Manoli already, but I actually found out when I visited his home uh, last year about DALI because of Leonard Boussieu, who was presenting the use of DALI. And he actually said something 
that makes a lot of sense for social justice, which is my main emphasis. He said anyone can learn how to use this technology. So it's actually a very democratic way, and, and Costi alluded to that, that it is not just for some elite few somewhere at an ivory, an ivory tower of you know, our institution, you know, the college up the street from MIT, uh, Harvard, <laughs> or you know, the institute down the street on Mass Ave from, from Harvard. So it is not just for some people. It is really easily accessible as long as you have at least some basic uh, infrastructure. For that, we'll hear more from, from Theo about the infrastructure and what we have in place and why we have that in place, I would imagine, at least for this institution and the archdiocese. But everyone can use that, and anyone can learn how to use it, which is even better. So I was really excited to try to experiment with that. I know I don't have that much time, but I will quickly tell you one more thing that uh, I was also amazed recently to find out more. I'm learning more and more about theology. I'm actually engaging in, in another graduate degree on theological bioethics. So I recently found out through the Orthodox Academy of Crete that I'm now affiliated with uh, something that some people mm -hmm. in the room and some other faculty from Hellenic College, Holy Cross, by the way, who is a student or an alumnus, uh, for alumna from uh, Hellenic College, Holy Cross? Let me see some hands. Students or alumni or any faculty? Do you have any faculty at Hellenic College? Excellent. So we have quite a few. And uh, you should know, if you don't already know, that there is this amazing new document that came out, I think exactly was Lent 2020, four years ago, called For the Life of the World, a new social ethos for uh, the Orthodox faith, essentially, in the church. I think I may have uh, paraphrased a little bit. But this is an amazing document. Father John was the chair of the special commission. And Gail, Professor Wolotsak, was also part of the commission, along with some, and a counterpart from uh, uh, Theo from the Archdiocese, and Nico something. Uh, but also one of your fa uh, faculty members uh, here, uh, who was dean until recently of, Helen College of the Holy Cross, School of Theology. So Dean Skedros was part of the commission, if I'm not mistaken. So I wanted to just juxtapose that a little bit with what is needed in science. And we heard so much about what Costi <coughs> told us already, about both the opportunities and the limitations. So I would like to focus on a new social ethos in science that will actually uh, elevate this social justice dimension, which is part of the bioethical principles. So this is the premise. Now, I did play around with Dali, and I have a number of images to, show, to share with you. Now, this is th those images you know, uh, have never been seen before, because they never existed before I played around with Dali. So it's quite you know, exciting. And who would have any ideas of how what kind of prompts, and you know, we learned about the prompts from Costi, what kind of prompt I may have used here? Any guesses? Actually, this is not just a presentation, it's a class. Did you know that? <laughs> Students of Hellenic College Holy Cross for credit, actually. <laughs> Any guesses? Yes, Manoli? AI playing God. Actually, it doesn't count. I shouldn't have called on Manoli, <laughs> sorry, because that was pretty close. <laughs> Anyone else? OK. AI is God, so extra points to Manoli. Honorary doctorate from Hellenic College, Holy Cross. Uh, who, any guesses on that? It's similar, but not the same. <laughs> Anyone other than Manoli? You can also play if you want. Uh, AI is God with empathy. All right, so that's that. Now, how about this? This is actually started getting more interesting. I don't know if you can see, but this is sort of like a new dialect. It's supposed to be saying bioethical intelligence, but I don't know what this veal is. So, uh, yeah, but but it takes the way that you would if you didn't wear your glasses. <laughs> that explains it. So that was the prompt: bioethical AI as healing the world. So I was actually motivated by the the life of the world document, uh, which is magnificent. This one similar, but now it gets even more interesting. So you see the the hands. Uh, and again, the dialect, or sort of, uh, I don't know what this could be called linguistically. Uh, bioethical, so that's more of a prompt here. Bioethical AI, healing the world, 
and theological, ethical, and pastoral perspectives. So that's that. And then I went even more. I said, okay, I'm excited. Let's see what else can, can come out of this. This is quite interesting, too. So that was, is a question, is artificial intelligence playing God? Which is exactly the title that we have, Theological, Ethical, Pastoral Perspectives of AI. And then I said, okay, what if I were to try, what would AI see him or herself, depending on how I want to call it, uh, as moral AI? And this gave me that, yes. So that's how AI sees, using DALI at least, this uh, moral aspect, which is significant for us bioethicists, by the way. What if I do moral AI, uh, and then what if I change it up a little bit, and I do theological, ethical, and pastoral perspectives? Just that. Look at this. This is like a whole new cosmos. This is like a whole new creation. Isn't it like actually emulating God? I, I was thinking, at least. And then what if you add AI to this? Theological, ethical, and pastoral perspectives of AI. What would that generate? And it generated that. Isn't that quite amazing? I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, to pat myself in the back. But this is quite amazing. And again, this has never existed before. So I was actually quite, quite drawn into this. Uh, now, the not so fun stuff, but it's quite, quite interesting because it is very relevant to social justice. Now, within bioethics, there are four main principles that have been developed. This is for all of bioethics, not just medical ethics. It includes ecological, environmental ethics, which is a big passion I know of our ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, whose birthday is today, by the way. So happy birthday. Uh, and uh, I know that it also includes many other elements that we call in bioethics non-human animals. So all the animal, only the animals and all of creation. So there are four main principles. I will go into that in a minute. But what we do uh, at the medical school we have a new curriculum that we're designing, and we have a big, big grant from the NIH called Pumas Grant that uh, is uh, in place to create anti-racism or anti-racism pedagogy using simulation, uh, uh, simulation scenarios. And uh, we want to train the next generation of geneticists and clinician scientists, as, as they're called, those who usually pursue the MD, PhD. I know at least one MD, PhD <coughs> who's in the room, uh, Ilya over there. So they have both the MD, the doctor of medicine, and the PhD at the same time, or one after the other. Now, we want to try to infuse three specific objectives to them. One is that the scientific and health fields have contributed to what is a social construct. So racism and race is a social construct. It is not something biological. And there is a report, a whole report that just came out that is speaking to that. So don't take my word for it, but it is actually the case. Population descriptors have been used in research and in some cases have perpetuated health inequities. We, talk, we heard a lot about biases. So that's all about prejudice, bias, and even structural violence, as we call it, that has been there for generations and centuries, actually. Uh, by the way, maybe uh, you don't know this, but you know, before we actually get into all the racism and what it is, what is not, uh, who, who actually would have figured that Caucasian, the word Caucasian to describe sometimes the white race or used interchangeably, is actually one of those constructs. It's not something that is biologically uh, a given. And it was actually a name that was used to describe, um, to describe uh, something that a German uh, anthropologist and uh, an archeologist named Johann Blaudenbach, Johann Friedrich Blaudenbach, who was born in 1755, used when he was excavating somewhere on the Caucasus region, the Caucasus Mountains, that for those who are not familiar with Europe or the rest of the world, it is way, way, way far away from Western Europe. 
So it has nothing to do almost with what you think a white European. But now he's using it interchangeably. And he, the only reason why he called it the Caucasian, uh, um, uh, he used a model that he found on one of the skeletons. And he said, OK, I really like the shape of, uh, th that the cranium ha has. And I will call it Caucasian to describe everyone moving forward. Now, so we have never interrogated, as it is with many biases, especially the unconscious ones, why is it the case that we call it as a given, whereas it is not really the case. So there are efforts, uh, uh, like the one I will mention very briefly, from major scientific bodies to actually reverse this status quo and to change the use of racial population descriptors in order to make basic research more rigorous and equitable. One of them is called the NASEM report, and the National Academies of Medicine, Engineering, and Science are really the biggest scientific bodies, the most rigorous and ex widely popular in the United States. And uh, this is primarily for genetics and genomics research, but it demythologizes and it dispels any kind of uncertainty or myth around what race is and if it is biological or not. So, and please let me know when I have about a, a minute or two because I may have already been over time, but I don't want to, you know, to take over anyone else's time. But uh, what, is, what is significant is one of uh, those quotes here. The structure of genetic variation results from repeated human population mixing and movements across time. Yet the misconception that human beings can be naturally divided into biologically distinguishable races has been extremely resilient and has become embedded in scientific research, medical practice, and technologies, and even formal education. I know that uh, Professor Wolotsak will talk a little bit more about some of those biases that has to do with uh, medical, uh, the medical world. But, but what I want to, again, uh, bring back into the picture is this, this juxtaposition. So if we know that there is so much bias in AI or machine learning, that actually is in parallel with the bias and the racism uh, that ex has existed for generations in all of science. So if we want to get rid of bias in AI, is my premise and my thesis, then we actually have to start from all of science and all of future scientists. So that's why I'm telling you more about this report and racism. And there are some very, very interesting quotes here about all these misconceptions and the injustice that have perpetuated those negative and sometimes egregious uh, things that we have do, done or scientists have, do, have done in the name of science and public health, like the Tuskegee syphilis study. Uh, it was going on for 40 years, from 1932 to 1972. That's essentially the biggest part of the reason why we have bioethics to begin with as a field. The Henrietta Lacks story in her cells, the HeLa cells, uh, that until recently we are never giving any credit to Henrietta Lacks herself. And that happened at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we have, of course, the atrocities in the name of medicine from the Nazi regime, Nazi medicine, and then uh, we have everything that followed with the Nuremberg trials and the Nuremberg Code of Ethics that, again, propelled the ignition of uh, the field of bioethics and the, and the emergence of the field of bioethics. Why now? Because recently, of course, there have been so many things that we are trying to do differently in the biomedical research community in terms of bioethics and social justice. And uh, I will just briefly tell you that this is the most significant that I want to share with you from the report. And this is the new framework for change that enumerates and illustrates both the principles on the left hand side. And I will go quickly into what those are, but also the requisites, the guidance for researchers, especially the future clinical scientists who may be using, of course, the AI, right? So they're the ones who will be using it for the healthcare, which is the biggest currently industry where AI is, is in use, as we also heard from Costi. So, and then the implementation that includes the dissemination of research. Another thing that has to do with social justice and democratization of science, as we say, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, Article 27 lists science as a human right. So 
all of you who are non-scientists, and I'm not saying that you know in a judgmental way, but you are in the humanities or you're in pursuing some other noble scientific field or academic field, also by being here can participate in the amazing science that we're uh, finding out uh, from Costi all about. But what about the folks in some marginalized communities in our metropolis of Boston from Roxbury, well, that is right next door to the Longwood Medical Area, who would never have had the chance to even come over here to, uh, to Brookline so that they can engage and participate in this celebration of science. So how are they going to, uh, to have a, a, the exercise of this human right? So sometimes there's a lot of criticism from within bioeth the bioethical community on how sometimes utopian the Declaration of Human Rights can appear, although important, of course, and, and necessary, when it works. So we have respect for the person, not just the patient, as we say in medical science. And uh, this is one of the most important bioethical principles. I only have about two minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm running over. Respect is a guiding principle. It will not give us all the answers, as we say in bioethics. It is a framework again. It is a system. It is a methodology. But it is guiding us to try to respect any human being and any living being, uh, all, all of creation, I would, I would add, from a theological lens. Um, beneficence, which sounds actually quite uh, theological also, because it is to do the right thing, to try to also avoid doing the wrong thing. Sometimes those, the non-maleficence uh, bioethical principle are discussed from Bitsam and Childress, who are the main gurus of bioethics from the 70s, as separate principles, but for the purposes of the study, they are embedded, it's embedded in beneficence. But non-maleficence, for those who know about the Hippocratic Oath or medical doctors, uh, it is primum non nocere in Latin. First do, uh, try to avoid harm. Try to not do the wrong thing. So primum non nocere non maleficence. This couldn't be embedded in those algorithms that Costi was, was uh, explaining and those mechanisms for machine learning so that they can try to apply this or they can create other algorithms to try to monitor for any kind of maleficence in place and say, wait a minute, we have non-maleficence in place, right? So this could be done in a different way that is currently the case to avoid all the harmful behaviors that we have seen. Like um, recently, I think just yesterday, the CEO of Google, uh, and there is this technology called Genesis, I think. Gemini. Ge Gemini. Gemini. Gemini was actually saying that we're not going to, uh, to uh, make any use of that because there have been some serious maleficent behaviors. So by doing that, by using non-maleficence and beneficence, we can avoid the potential negative effects such as the stigma, discrimination, and exacerbation of racial inequities that have always been in place, unfortunately, in science. And if we do that, then it will have a more just way of, um, of disseminating essentially science and applying that to the algorithms of the future. And the most important for my purposes is the equity and justice principle. Uh, recognizing those inequities wherever they exist, especially within science and academia, and then infusing all of these in some kind of you know, clever algorithms Again, to detect and avoid things that would be harmful, unjust, and, uh, and uh, maleficent, again, to use that term, right? Avoid reproducing hierarchical thinking that has been embedded in the historical use of systems such as race in science. If we do that, I would hypothesize again that that will be better off. And that's what we usually ask the students in this course. How can you actually apply the principles and infuse or embed those within AI so that future clinician scientists may implement the principle of social justice in their work? This is something that the, the report itself is using, and I only have, that's the last slide. Uh, but just for, uh, for example, what would geneticists do differently when using AI? Well, there would be some cases where 
uh, it should not be used. So race or uh, is even as a category or ethnicity as a descriptor should not be used, although currently it is the place. In the same way, we should not be using a given that, you know, this is one race, that's the other race, to train those algorithms as long as we understand that in some cases, for instance, you know, with health disparities with genomic data, no, not all health disparity studies rely on descent associated population groupings. So none may be necessary for analysis. So if we take that as a recommendation from the National Academies of Science and Medicine and Engineering, they want not teach that to all of, let's say, Costis's future <laughs> PhD students or future amazing folks who develop those algorithms further in computer science and machine learning to actually emulate what is the case from scientific research as, as, a, as a basis for information. And I will just leave you with that because sometimes we don't even realize all the biases that we carry as folks in academia or scientists. And there are many different agendas that uh, come into play. So I will leave you with this image again from exactly what the title was. And I really look forward to hearing more from uh, our other two speakers. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Simopoulos, thank you very much um, for actually moving beyond just ethics and the ethical perspectives and introducing the word ethos, which gives us a sense of the, the whole outlook, the insight behind how we can shape AI. Thank you so much. Dr. Wallachek, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Father John, for inviting me to this uh, really great group. I'm very happy to be here, or to be back at Holy Cross. I feel like sometimes this is a second home. I've been here so much. Um, so I want to thank both Costis 1 and 2 for, uh, for, for setting things up for me so that I can, uh, so I don't have to go through a lot of introductory material. Um, what I'm going to do today is to tell a few stories that I hope will kind of illustrate points about AI. The first, I'm not using PowerPoint. Nope. No, I'm just telling you stories. So. <laughs> so, so the first story is about uh, my own lab and my science and how much I love AI and how we can do things that we can't do otherwise. The second thing is about education in the classroom and AI in the classroom. I'm a dean of students at Northwestern, and I have stories about that. The third is a story about priests and pastoral approaches with AI. The fourth is about a medical department. I'm actually in the, med the radiation oncology department, and it's going to be ha how AI is having impact there. So let me start with the science story. So I want you to, I'm a biologist. I want you to think about your bodies. You have 30 trillion cells in your body, 30 trillion. Back in chemistry someplace, you saw a giant periodic chart, remember? It had carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and all those things on it. Well, it turns out that most of those elements, with the exception of a few, like plutonium and uranium, we hope, are in your body. Now, plutonium and uranium, we don't want in the body. They shouldn't be there. They may be there, but they're not supposed to be. But my lab is mapping the 30 trillion cells for every element on the periodic table. And it's not just telling which cells they're in or which types of cells they're in, but where they are in the cells. Think about the enormity of that project, right? Huge project. It's being done with supercomputers at Argonne National Laboratory, where I used to work and I still have an appointment. And it's being done with synchrotron radiation in order to detect the elements on the periodic table. This project was not possible even five years ago with the computational power that we had. So this is possible only because of AI. I, and for that reason, I love AI, OK? So that's story number one. Let's go to story number two. As I said, I'm, I'm an associate dean in the graduate school. And I'm the person that hears every academic integrity case that comes up before the graduate students at the university. So I have to listen to the student's story. I have to adjudicate whether or not this was a true academic integrity violation. And then I have to figure out what punishment the student is going to have to have. 
So a recent case, a student, the professor who was teaching the class pointed out that they believed the student had used ChatGPT in writing their paper. And when it, we, we put it through one of those algorithms that tests whether it's ChatGPT, but those are actually often erroneous. We have like three or four of those in the graduate school and one of them turns out positive and one of them turns out negative. But when you read through the paper, this, there, there, was, there was massive confusion within the paper. It didn't even make sense. In one case, they're talking about imprinting. Do you remember like that imprinting you learned about where the ducks follow each other? In one case, they're talking about that kind of imprinting. And in the other, in another, they're talking about genetic imprinting, which is where you inherit certain genes from your parents that are expressed differently. And those were confused and messed up in the whole paper. Now, it's possible that the student just did this all by themselves, but when I asked him, he didn't know the difference and wasn't sure what he was talking about with imprinting. Well, then I asked him, well, did you use ChatGPT for this? And he had no clue what ChatGPT was. I mean, now, I, maybe, uh -huh. maybe, I, you know, maybe I, I couldn't recognize it very well. Well, we tracked it back and it turned out that he didn't write the paper. His brother wrote the paper for him. <laughs> and his brother used ChatGPT to write the paper, okay? So, so what's the lesson of this story? The lesson is don't use ChatGPT inappropriately. Students, do not use it to write your papers. Or if you are allowed to use it to write your papers, check it very, very carefully. ChatGPT hallucinates, it makes many mistakes, and can be problematic. But the other lesson is don't trust people you buy homework from <laughs> because it might not be what you expect. And don't okay? ask your brother. Yeah, especially your brother. <laughs> Okay, so story number three. This past summer, I, I was at Volos Academy. And I was invited by the people at the academy to teach a course on AI to a group of uh, clergy priests from Ukraine. Now, I'm Ukrainian. So for me, it was a great joy to be able to teach with them. And we had, we had a blast together. But for one of the AI sessions, we, we did an exercise. I put the web browser up on the, on the screen. And, we, uh, and I said, OK, let's have ChatGPT write a sermon. Let's pick a topic. What, what topic? And they said, oh, Feast of the Transfiguration is coming up very soon. So we asked ChatGPT, write a sermon for an Orthodox Christian parish on the feast of the to be given on the Feast of the Transfiguration. And I asked then the group of clergy to analyze that sermon and give me their perspectives on what it was and whether it was good or bad. Well, they said, look, it's accurate. Everything in there is absolutely accurate. But there's no human dimension in this. This is not a sermon that a priest would give to his parishioners. This is a sermon that a computer wrote. Um, so so what, they, they, what they said and what we agreed upon was that there is a sermon that is right for that group of people on that day from that priest. This sermon was not that. And they all agreed that ChatGPT is probably not going to be useful for writing sermons. Why? Because sermons need a human dimension to it. They're not something that can be done generically. They require a human, di a human dimension. OK, so fourth story. This is the story of my radiation oncology department. So I, I work at the kind of cusp of radiology and radiation oncology, and these fields are just blooming, especially radiology with uh, AI being used for image analysis, for uh, being able to do predictive analysis on what kinds of diseases people are likely to have, to be able to understand what, um, what, what processes might be ongoing. And they're really facilitating diagnosis of disease uh, significantly. Um, so what happens is you can put in a series of features that you know about the, um, say for instance, the x-rays, the CT scans, the MRs, bring them all back and make a good prediction of what, what AI can make a good prediction of what the disease is that the person's dealing with. But what, and, and that's very useful. It's not 100% it's not accurate. Most of the algorithms need time and probably we're gonna get better and better accuracy with time. 
where, the, where they seem to fall down is not with the diagnosis, but with the projected treatment. So what happens is the, it, the AI will tell them recommended treatments for that patient. And it takes age and things like that into consideration. But it doesn't take, what does that patient look like? How debilitated are they? You know, one 65-year-old is different from a different, one 82-year-old is different from another 82-year-old, right? They're not all the same. And, and sometimes a physician makes a decision that this patient is robust and can manage to take a severe, difficult chemo, and this patient is not so robust and is not going to handle it. Or they make decisions based on the fact that when you go home, you have a lot of support to take care of you. When you go home, you don't have a lot of support to take care of you. How do you manage that? That's something that AI, AI has not been trained to do, and I am not convinced AI is going to, and neither are physicians convinced that AI is going to be trained to do it. So one of the things I'm trying to say here is there are things AI is great for. There are things that we need human touch for. And that human touch is not easily put into a computational approach. So I have, a, I have a final point that I'm going to do what everybody else has done, which is to give an example from AI. But I want you to listen carefully to this, because I want you to see if you can figure out what's sort of wrong with it. So I asked ChatGPT. This is what I asked for. Write a limerick about a group of scholars holding a panel discussion on the benefits and limitations of AI. Okay. A group of bright scholars convened to discuss AI unseen but keen. They debated all night on its wrongs and its rights in a world where the digital is queen. Okay? What's that last sentence? In the world where the digital is queen. AI is saying that we're going to say AI is good. So AI is biased in this example. I have done many, many limericks through ChatGPT, and every time I do them, the first pass is always with a bias about something. Either my own personal bias, which was picked up on the internet, or a bias that comes in through this route. So I just want to be cautious to say that it, AI does learn from the exact same things we talked about, but there is a bias in it. OK, what I want to end with is to say, that there have been all kinds of uh, big, big issues that have been raised about AI, its concerns about changing jobs, losing people losing their jobs, which I'm not convinced are, are all that real because people are just switching into AI types of jobs. But the thing I think we it, AI should make us do is reflect on what makes us unique as human beings. What do we bring to the table that we're probably never going to be able to train a machine to be able to do for us? Um, humans develop culture. We can try to teach a machine culture, but I'm not sure we can do that so easily. We, we have an ethics about what we do. Humans have language, and we speak. AI is going to be able to speak, but it's going to speak our language. It's going to speak what we developed, what came about through our learning and evolution over all the years. So I, th I, think, that, I think there's also a uniqueness of being that is different for different humans that we're not going to see from AI. Um, so my final point would be, um, I think we need to be cautious about what responsibilities we turn over to AI. And I think we need to use AI has the opportunity to reflect on what makes us uniquely human instead of just what can we make AI do. Thank you. Gail, thank you so much. I think we're really breaking it down now, and we're heading to Teo, who's going to be talking about the, the practical, the pastoral. Uh, I, get, I get it that... ChatGPT shouldn't be used, and I don't think it's very good anyway for graduate uh, essays. But I know at least a couple of priests and bishops who could use ChatGPT for their sermons. <laughs> so.
Matteo, the floor is yours. Father John, thank you for that warm introduction. And it's really such an honor to be here with such distinguished panelists to talk about AI. So I'd like to just start this off by saying a little story. Uh, many years ago, Bishop Yakovos of Chicago of blessed memory called his chancellor, Father Dimitri, into his office. Please send this urgent letter, the bishop said. I can fax it, replied Father Dimitri. Looking strangely, Bishop Yakovos said, what is this fax? Well, I put the letter into our fax machine and just a few moments later, the letter will come out on their fax machine on the other side at their office, the chancellor replied. Really? Bishop Yakovos said skeptically. Then let us try this fax. And so Chancellor Father Dimitri sent the fax. He then returns to Bishop Yakovos' office to report his success and hands him the now fax letter and says, here you go. Bishop Yakovos looks at the letter and then at Father Dimitri, disturbed, and says, What is this? I thought you said you were going to fax it. I, I did, Father Dimitri said. Bishop Yakovos then retorts, Then why is the letter still here? <laughs> I certainly don't mean to pick on Metropolitan Yakovos of blessed memory. Nevertheless, this amazing vignette highlights some of the tensions between technological advancements and the tango that takes place in the church, and how innovation is fostered, often as a bottom-up endeavor. So given my experiences trying to forge the path of technology leadership in the church as CIO for the Archdiocese, and make innovation more of a top-down and a grassroots-up partnership, there are a few themes that I'd like to explore as it relates to artificial intelligence or AI. Is it good or evil? I've witnessed enough technological change and disruption during my tenure that I feel as though I can almost predict the cycles of how technological disruption, including AI, will unfold in church circles. Chief among them tends to be the universal declaration of evil on the disruptive technology. Radio, television, computers, the internet, live streaming social media, and now AI. Let me explain. In another real-life encounter around 97, 1998, I called one of our bishops of blessed memory with the aim of establishing local internet ministry teams in each diocese. The metropolises were dioceses at the time. I called the diocese, asked for the bishop, and his assistant answered and transferred the call. The bishop picks up the phone and, without skipping a breath, begins, The internet is evil. It is the spawn of Satan. It is the gateway to sin and calamity. After his two-minute Shakespearean monologue, he concluded, Dear Teo, how can I help you? Contrary to the bishop's well-intentioned comments, allow me to frame it clearly. The technology itself is neither good nor evil. Rather, the moral, ethical, and theological implications stem from intent and therefore design safeguards, or lack thereof, power, application of the technology, and, to an extent, ownership. Look at the advent of photography as an understandable example of what I'm talking about and how AI comes into play. It's one thing to take a family portrait, quite another to capture and distribute child pornography. It's one thing to use AI to generate a composite photo of your relatives and loved ones, and yet another to create and disseminate AI-generated new deepfake images of school children, as some students in Beverly Hills Vista Middle School did just this past week. On March 15, 2006, the Hierarchs of Scoba, Scoba was the standing conference of canonical Orthodox bishops in the U.S., and that was the precursor to the Assembly of Bishops, comprised of the Orthodox jurisdictions in the U.S., the Scoba Hierarchs issued an encyclical on the well-being of children. Addressed to the parents and clergy, the encyclical's aim was to address the proliferation of smart devices and what could be accessed through those devices. The Scoba hierarch stated, the technology itself is not dangerous. The danger lies in the fact that there are no safeguards or regulations in place to protect children and teens. In their common declaration on environmental ethics on June 10, 2002, Pope John Paul II and Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew said it best. 
we are called to use science and technology in a full and constructive way while recognizing that the failings of science always have to be evaluated in the light of the centrality of the human person, of the common good, and the inner purpose of creation. In other words, from the perspective of the church, technological advancements and their impact on the human person are inseparable and together begin to form our moral compass. The Orthodox Church's theological stance on technological advancement has been consistent. However, and here's the big observation, how a particular technology is understood by an Orthodox hierarch, cleric, seminarian, or the self-proclaimed Orthodox blogger can sometimes be colored by one, technological ignorance. Let's look at that fact story as an example. If you cannot grasp the, te the technology, you certainly can't adopt it. Number two, false generalizations. Anecdotal stories about an aspect of the technology in the media or a single experience are used to characterize the technology. Three, ossification. We're comfortable. We've done it this way for however long, therefore we don't really need to change or do things differently. Four, spiritual fear-mongering. Using any or all of the aforementioned to personify an enemy with the aim of forming cultic bonds within one's flock. And so that leads me to my second point about the theological framework for technology in general and AI in particular. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 sets the stage when God says, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness. Communion with God, theosis, is the goal of the Christian life. Technologies that help us grow in God's image and likeness, which enhance our relationship with God and one another, can and should be celebrated and appropriately enculturated within their appropriate limits. What's fascinating about the Genesis account is that two chapters later, juxtaposed against the grace of being made in God's image and likeness, is the first sin, ivris or hubris, striving to be equal to or greater than God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, we find that archetypal encounter between the woman, Eve as of yet has no name, and the serpent. The serpent tempts the woman to partake of the fruit of the tree. As the scripture says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Allow me to point out two details worth emphasizing from the Genesis account. The first is how we as human beings have a proclivity to self-justify sin, to self-justify the things that are wrong and lines that should remain uncrossed. In the next verse, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, we read, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. So for those of you who incorrectly blame Eve, I have news. Adam's right there. He says nothing. The man is complicit. We collectively have the moral obligation to speak up to conclusions and actions that are wrong. And as it per pertains to AI, isn't there a wonderfully seductive allure to the potential power, to the explosive creativity and the potential benefits in medicine, research, publishing, art, business efficiencies, and so much more? AI has the potential to commoditize and lower the barrier of entry to disciplines that were out of reach to the masses just six months ago. Look at what OpenAI's Sora promises to bring with its ability to create full motion videos just from a few pieces of text. I mean, look at this incredible video that was generated by Sora, how realistic and believable it is without any camera equipment or specialized software other than the AI engine. In fact, 
if we as a church can begin now to think through and leverage positively AI services like Sora, imagine what we could do in the realm of content creation for religious education, youth outreach, Christian children's entertainment that just 14 days ago would have been cost prohibitive for us to even entertain the idea. And yet, that potential allure is unquestionably scented with the underlying perfume of really unprecedented power that permeates almost every aspect of AI's potential. Shall we now start to begin to question what's real? What's believable? How will, not can, this be abused for political and maybe even sinister aims? And so, in my opinion, the distinct role of the church is to be exactly that lens of theocrisis, of discernment to the world. That theocrisis should compel all of us, especially those in positions of power, to shape and guide the development of AI, to implement it in such a way that it upholds the dignity of the human person that creates and strengthens the bonds of community, that prevents that gross abuse and depraved fall into hubris that the power of any new technology promises. The so-called freedom to do anything with technology in general, and AI in particular, is a lie, just like the words of the serpent. St. Paul put it best in his epistle to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 10.23, he is quoting the Corinthians who are saying, I have the right to do anything, you say, St. Paul says, but not everything is beneficial, he responds. I have the right to do anything, the Corinthians are saying, but not everything is constructive, St. Paul responds. Jesus says it even more bluntly. Very truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And in our worldview, in the lens of the church, as 2 Peter 2, chapter 2, verse 19 says, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, for people are slaves to whatever masters them. What is truth? So my third point is the nature of truth. In the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John, according to John, Pontius Pilate interrogates Jesus about the accusation that he is the king of the Jews. As their dialogue progresses, Jesus answers Pilate in verse 37 and says, You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorts Pilate. When I was a biblical and theological studies major during my undergraduate work at Gordon College, one of my academic classes focused on learning the different tools in scholarly biblical studies. During one exercise, we were tasked to look on such topics and research them, such as baptism, the Eucharist, the sacraments, and to summarize these topics from different reference works. Who knew that there were so many divergent views? The point of the exercise was to identify theological viewpoints, indeed theological biases, in different texts during scholarly research. This reality in the physical world is that much more acute with AI. At least in a library, you know what to expect from the Catholic Encyclopedia or the Baptist Encyclopedia. With AI, however, we as end users and consumers need transparency into the body of information the AI engine has been trained with. What are the moral and ethical boundaries and biases built into the generative AI? And perhaps more telling, what are the moral and ethical principles of the company behind the AI? What tokens and vectors is the AI using to process the questions or input? We cannot today see how AI is working, how the AI is thinking. It's a proverbial black box. And then there's the tendency for AI to hallucinate. Yes, it's a technical term when AI conjures up falsehoods. And when AI hallucinates, its answers can be extremely convincing to the undiscerning end user. And so, a question that I think we as Orthodox Christians specifically and as human beings more broadly need to ponder very seriously is, what is truth? And when it comes to AI, 
how will truth be defined and propagated as AI proliferates in both developed and underdeveloped societies? When an AI can create the illusion of truth through a position paper, an image, or a viral video, the potential stakes reach a whole new level. And then this leads me to my fourth point on the nature of authority and authenticity with AI. Let's start with the concept of authority. I think that there's oftentimes a correlation between the perception of truth and authority. And by authority, I mean the right to give permission or sanction. By authority, I mean the notion of giving definitive statements or positions in one who can influence others' thinking or actions. And now think about authority and the church. I would argue that in ecclesiastical circles, our paradigm for millennia has been to correlate authority with the office. Patriarch, archbishop, metropolitan, priest, synod. In the past 15 years, the very underpinnings of what constitutes authority have been undergoing a tectonic cultural shift since the advent of social media. Is authority now based on one's office and position, or is authority now consolidated into how many followers you have, how many likes you have, or what your reach is? Selena Gomez or Taylor Swift, anyone? AI promises to complicate the notion of authority even further, with AI promising to become the de facto authority on any topic. Let's look at a few examples from Gab.ai, which has a nice faith-based AI character set, such as St. Athanasius of Alexandria, Pope Francis, St. Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, Mother Teresa, St. Patrick, and others. And let me give you a flavor of some queries that I ran as examples. Now notice, that the AI will sometimes respond with the phrase, as a Christian theologian, or in my opinion. Well, did Holy Cross School of Theology suddenly issue an honorary doctorate to Gab AI? Of course not. While on the surface, those phrases may seem trivial, and I understand it's attempting to portray the persona. However, take serious note that there is a clear undertone of authority in the response. Associating AI with authoritative responses has the potential to be dangerous. Authority then correlates closely to authenticity. How about Gab AI's character Grace, the so-called AI Christian counselor? Well, I asked Grace to share a Bible verse that had been meaningful to her. The response? Certainly. One verse that has been perfectly meaningful to me is Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This verse has helped me to remember that with God's help, I'm able to overcome any challenge that comes my way. It has also been a source of comfort and encouragement in times of difficulty. No AI system, no matter how well trained, no matter how well it uses vectorized information, will be authentic in matters of faith. Does generative AI contemplate existential questions? Does generative AI comprehend joy, sorrow, nurturing, compassion, repentance, forgiveness? Or indeed, the myriad of experiences that shape us in our walk of faith. The implications, at least to me, are a harbinger of the overuse and even misuse of AI in our church environments. Authenticity and authority, I would argue, are intertwined. So, should a priest deliver an outstanding sermon, quote scripture, reference experiences or stories, or talk about a faith walk or commitment to Christ, using AI for their charismatic ministry, what is it? To me, and through my theological lens, this is geno, it's empty. It's text is no different than a lip sync song by Millie Vanilli. And this is the potential danger that I see with the misapplication of AI in theological circles and pastoral settings. Faith is a direct encounter with the living God, not a computer mediated experience. From my perspective, the use of AI in matters of faith must always be authentic. I think this is 
where the collection of essays in the first volume of Father George Florovsky's collected works, uh, The Bible, Church, and Tradition, are relevant. Father Florovsky highlights the patristic position expressed through St. Hilary's famous phrase, Scripture is not in the reading, but in the understanding. I would therefore urge the importance to develop an ecclesiastical, scriptural, and patristic mindset, or phronima, as an important prerequisite of using AI responsibly in the church. And that then leads me to my fifth point, which is talk a little bit about Spider-Man and what I call the Spider-Man principle. You all know who Spider-Man is, I presume. In the comics, when Peter Parker is first bitten by a radioactive spider and gains his super strength, and senses he first becomes a wrestler to earn prize money before he actually becomes Spider-Man. One night after winning his match, he goes to pick up his winnings and the promoter stiffs him from his rightfully earned winnings. No sooner does Peter leave the office and a thug robs the promoter. The thug then darts from the office and run to runs toward Peter. Instead of stopping the thief, Peter lets him run by into the elevator and escape. When Peter gets to street level, he sees his Uncle Ben's car and comes upon his Uncle Ben, shot and killed. As we know, the murderer was the very thief Peter allowed to escape. Indeed, with great power comes great responsibility, is what Uncle Ben always told Peter. And as Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. There is a moral responsibility that comes along with any ability. This could not be truer with the blinding speed in which AI-enabled tools are coming before us. On the one hand, our responsibility as church is to be precisely that moral compass with the proper use of AI to set the right boundaries. On the other hand, the proliferation of these amazing AI tools compels us to harness their power and potential for a new evangelization. I would argue that what we need to seize at this moment of disruption and leverage is to leverage these AI services for the benefit of our ministries. The Lord will ask us indeed to give an account on the talents and what will we repay him with? My sixth point, touches upon pastoral implications. The world's changed. The how it's changed and how we're gonna perceive it changed, well, that's still unfolding. The daunting challenge on the horizon is going to be when businesses, governments, people, even religious groups begin to cede decision-making capabilities to AI. Pope Francis, in his January 1, 2024 message on the 57th World Day of Peace, raised the warning of AI's growing impact on the fabric of societies and its profound influence on cultures, societal behaviors, and peace building. At its best, AI should be of service to humanity and not at its worst, where humanity becomes subservient to AI. How are we then adopting AI at the Archdiocese? And that's really my final point. What are we doing at the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America? Much is expected of us. While you may perceive the repetition of the safeguards throughout my talk, my heart is that we need to move with urgency. We've already started rolling out Microsoft's AI Engine Copilot to select staff, and we've begun testing. For us, it's important that we can train the AI Engine on our known data sets within the church. Our concurrent step must be to foster some leadership in this area, some thought leadership and educate the Archbishop, the Metropolitans, ministry leaders with the opportunities and the pitfalls that come with AI. I am excited to explore opportunities for AI to help us accelerate development for new educational curriculum, perhaps most importantly, how AI can help us develop visual and interactive programming that just would have been cost prohibitive for us to consider a few years ago. Likewise, thanks to Leadership 100, we're looking to deploy an AI-based system at one of our key metropolitan area parishes to see how AI can help us discern aspects of people's visits to the church that might then give us insight into ministry opportunities and even tailored ministry programs 
in that community. At the Clergy Lady Congress in San Diego this summer, we will be furthering dialogue on AI for both the clergy and laity of our archdiocese and hopefully training the clergy and parishioners on some of the available AI tools. We must have the leadership and thought leadership to guide responsible practice from sound theory in our communities. Yes, we have some natural concerns such as the data sets that are used by the AI and conversely, we have security concerns about the information we might submit to train the AI. That's why we're taking the path that we're taking. I've made a concerted effort to offer AI cyber training, cybersecurity training for all archdioceses and metropolis staff. So that's just a small lens into some of the things that we're looking to do. So in summary, technological disruptions are a natural part of life. And they're also sacred ministry opportunities. Something of the scale and potential of AI in so many spheres should be received with metered excitement. If you're ignorant about AI, remain ignorant no more. Disruptions can re-level the playing field. Communities of faith that take advantage of AI's advancements today can seize ministry opportunities and park up, embark upon new avenues of evangelization tomorrow. Faith communities harnessing the potential those disruptive moments can lead will leapfrog those who don't. Advancements in AI are opportunities for the church and our faithful to re-engage their faith, to reposture ourselves, to take advantage of new opportunities for bringing the gospel into the minds and hearts of all people. Put another way, it's an opportunity for renewal and reinvigoration of the church's mission-oriented apostolic heritage. It is that very disruption of AI that brought us together tonight. It piqued our curiosity and stimulated our minds. I applaud the Vatican's efforts in AI, which really are a model for all the churches. I want to thank my fellow panelists uh, this evening for their insights. Uh, Father John Crisavis, I laud you for organizing this panel. And Mr. Huffington, thank you for your tremendous support and for what the Huffington Ecumenical Institute is doing by providing this pivotal opportunity to discuss the potentials and the pitfalls within the church and society. Thank you.